Here we go with a Game 5 recap of the World Chess Championship. The match is tied 2-2. Two to two. All four games have been draws, and we have seen two anti-martial Roy Lopez systems when Jan plays white. And here we go again, Jan playing white. I'm going to blitz out the first uh, eight moves. This is a repeat of what we saw in game number three. So we reach this point, Jan plays a4, and just as a reminder, uh, c3 leads to the martial gambit. After d5, e takes d, some trades happen, and we get this end position where black is down one pawn, but has all of the pieces active attacking kingside. So Magnus is kind of showing Jan that he is willing to go into the martial gambit, and in all three games where Jan had white, he's avoided the martial. So again, he's avoiding with a4, repeat from game number three. Now here, Magnus uh, is the first player to deviate from game three, plays a move that he played against Duda in the FIDE World Cup earlier this year, and Jan was definitely ready for it. A takes B, A takes B, and Jan plays a rare move, H3, uh, the fifth most popular move. C3 is the most common, but Jan played this quickly, so this was definitely in his preparation. Now we see D6 by Magnus, and here you can note that all the pieces are symmetric. Both sides have only lost an A pawn, everything else is symmetric, but we're going to see in a couple moves that white has a few slight advantages that all add up to just put a little bit of pressure on Magnus in this position. Jan plays c3, preparing d4, and here Magnus counters this with a very nice idea, pawn to b4. Now stay tuned because things are really going to heat up in the next nine moves. Uh, d4 could be played here as an aggressive move trying to gain space in the center, but after b takes c, b takes c, e takes d, c takes d, d5, this is close to equalizing for black. And you can see the strength of that b4 move by Magnus because trading off the b pawns actually opens up Magnus's rook on the open b file. So that was a nice idea by Magnus. Jan plays this a little bit slower with pawn to d3, but still holding his advantages. And now we see b takes c opening up the rook, b takes c, and Magnus plays the critical move pawn to d5. This is the strongest move. He wants to get trades in the center, uh, hoping to equalize. Now we see knight b to d2, a flexible move by Jan, and this knight can head to c4, follow the green arrow, hitting this pawn on e5, and it can also head to f1, followed up by g3 or e3, which hits some important squares um, in the black camp on the light squares, like the e5, or sorry, the d5 and f5 squares. So a lot of different plans for this knight. Jan is staying very flexible. d takes e4 was played. And if Magnus doesn't take this pawn on e4, Jan can actually increase the pressure with moves like bishop to a4. So this is a good move by Magnus. And here Jan had 1 hour and 57 minutes remaining. They only started with 2 hours. And Magnus had an hour 39 remaining. So definitely Jan feels more comfortable and he's playing much more quickly. d takes e4. Now let's take a look here at the imbalances. So we talked about earlier how white had some slight advantages with the imbalances. Compare this c7 pawn to the c3 pawn. The c7 pawn is blocked by the knight on c6, and the c6 knight is uh, tied down to the defense of the e pawn. Whereas the c3 pawn guards these important squares d4 and b4, and if we compare the rooks, the rook on e1 is more active than the rook on f8. So Magnus has all of these slight weaknesses, whereas Jan has just small improvements over those counterparts um, on Magnus's side. So those all add up to just a very slight advantage, and if Magnus makes one slip up in a position like this, Jan could get a clear advantage and play for the win. But at this point, it's still closer to draw territory. We see bishop to d6 by Magnus. This creates a tall pawn. It's blocked in by both of these pawns. Um, not the best square for the bishop usually, but it's solid and Magnus wants to reroute this knight over to g6. We see queen c2 by Jan, another very flexible move. He's looking at ideas bishop a4, knight c4, or knight to f1. And here we see Magnus play h6, also a flexible move. So this position doesn't require the opponents to play real quickly yet and super aggressive, but this is a prophylactic move. It prevents an idea of knight to g5 later. So for example, let's say instead of h6, Magnus plays knight e7, knight c4 could be played, bishop e6. Now Jan could play knight to g5, making it very uncomfortable for this bishop. 
and the bishop now has to take the knight. Bishop takes back, and now look at this imbalance with the minor pieces. We see two bishops for white, and black only has one bishop. So this is called the bishop pair, and that's something that grandmasters really love to have, the bishop pair advantage. So this would give Jan a little bit extra to play for, having that bishop pair advantage. So h6 was played in the game. Now we see knight f1 by Jan, and look at the activity of these pieces. All of these pieces are trying to point over to Magnus' king side, so that's what he's going for. We see knight e7 by Magnus, heading to g6, trying to match this activity on the king side. Both knights move to the g-file. Bishop e3, and Jan is very slightly increasing his advantage here. Um, next he wants to get the rooks into the game. Rook e to d1, and the a1 rook can come up to a5, or even potentially a7. Now this is where things get really interesting. Magnus spends 20 minutes on this next move and plays queen to e8. Now as spectators, we have the advantage of looking at the Stockfish engine. This is actually a mistake. Um, what could have been played here is pawn to c4, but Jan missed it. So let's compare the difference. Um, let's say black plays queen e7 instead of queen e8. This is the strongest move in the position. Now if c4 is played, Magnus can play bishop to b4, hitting the rook, and after the rook moves, blockade this pawn and essentially force the trade of the dark square bishops. So this would be completely equal position. Magnus gets rid of the bad bishop, keeps his good bishop, no advantage at all for Jan. After queen to e8, Jan missed this move, pawn to c4, and this is a big advantage. After bishop to e6, uh, bishop to a4 can be played, hitting the queen, and c5 is coming up next. This is a really nice advantage. And the computer is actually saying 0.7 tenths of a pawn. So 0.7 is very close to winning at the Super GM level. I mean, there's a lot of pressure on black here. But in the game, Jan played 20 rook e to d1 after an 11 minute think. And now we're getting a little bit closer to draw territory. But things do heat up just a bit coming up. So we see bishop to e6, Magnus gets his plan move in, offering the trade of the light squared bishops. Bishop to a4, bishop back to d7. All right, so Jan has to find a new plan. These bishops are just shuffling back and forth. He goes knight to d2, allowing the bishop trade, but keeping this imbalance of good bishop against bad bishop, and Jan wants to play knight to c4. So now we see a bunch of uh, pieces trade off. Jan takes with the queen, allowing the queen trade, and the players just blitzed out these moves. I was really surprised how fast these moves were all played. So they had this all figured out. All of these pieces were going to trade off. Rook to b8. Now at this point we're at move 26. We have 49 minutes remaining for Magnus, an hour and 13 remaining for Jan. The computer evaluates this as 0.00, but it's still slightly more comfortable for Jan, and he's going to press a bit here. So Jan plays rook to a8, hitting that d6 bishop, threatening knight to f5. And we see knight to e8 by Magnus, and look what he wants to do. He wants all of his pawns and the tall pawn, this bishop, all sitting on dark squares. And he just wants to sit back and play solid, play defensive, and make Jan crack this structure. Jan plays king to f1, and this king wants to start to head towards d3. King e2, king d3, and get active. Knight to f8 by Magnus, just kind of creating this fortress on the king side. Maybe he'll play f6, g6, um, knight up to e6. Knight f5, putting another attacker on the d6 bishop. And now we had an hour and three remaining for Jan, only 33 minutes for Magnus. And they have to go to move 40, we're at move 29. Knight e6 by Magnus, knight to c4, threatening to win a pawn. We have three attackers, two defenders. Rook to d8, and now we see f3 by Jan. And here the game actually gets pretty boring. Both sides seem very happy with the draw. Even though they spent some time, we see f6 by Magnus playing solid. And now g4 by Jan. It looks like he's going for kingside expansion with h4 and maybe an attack, but really this uh, peters out into nothing. And I'll show you very quickly what happens next. King f7, h4, bishop f8, Magnus just holding solid. And after a few moves here, 
um, they decide to trade everything off and they started blitzing the moves again. So I think when they're blitzing the moves like this and making trades, they're actually okay with the draw. So we see takes, takes, h5. Now neither pawn can really advance on the g file. Uh, Magnus doesn't want to play g6 because the h pawn drops and Jan can't play g5. Bishop f8. And at this point, I think the players just tried to figure out how can we trade off all the pieces or repeat. They found a repetition. Draw agreed. So that was game five. Uh, there was that missed opportunity on move 20 to play a pawn to c4, creating a big advantage for Jan. So it's going to be very interesting to see in the next game where Jan has the white pieces, will Magnus play something different than that early rook to b8? Because Jan had a chance here to play for the win. All right, thanks for watching this Game 5 recap, and we will see you for Game 6.